Welcome all. We're going to go ahead and get started. We're uh, super excited to have you here to share a little bit of our research for uh, Social Sciences Week. Uh, we're doing a presentation that I'm sure you all have know. The title is Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in Outdoor Adventure Therapy Education. This is a mixed method study that we've been working on for, for quite a while here, and we're, we're super jazzed to, to share it out with you all. Uh, we're also doing a recording of this, so if anyone doesn't want to be recorded, make sure to mute your video, and we can always share this afterwards and everything as well. Um, so we'll go ahead, and we're going we're gonna to jump right in. Um, and we're gonna do some introductions. My name is Daniel Kavanaugh. I'm a uh, doctor of social work and a licensed clinical social worker. I'm also an associate clinical professor and the director of the Bachelor's of Social Work program at Washington State University in Richland, Washington. Uh, next, we'll uh, go to Christy. Hi folks, I'm Christy Cummings. I'm an assistant professor and MSW program director at University of North Florida in social work. On to you, Winnie. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm Winnie Liu, and I am a PhD candidate at the University of North Texas and an assistant director at our um, training clinic. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Russo. I live in Seattle, Washington, um, and I teach for the University of Washington through the School of Social Work, in addition to being um, a social worker out in the field. And also I'll jump back in the slide that we do have other research contributors on this who haven't joined for this presentation, but Kelly Pirtle, who's a master's in public health, uh, working for Oregon Health and Sciences University, and Dr. Will Dobud, who works at Charles Street University and is one of the, the hosts of this meeting. So they've also worked on this project. Uh, so I want to make sure to give them some credit as well. Um, so Winnie's going to go ahead and jump in and share some background about what we're doing and why we're doing it. Excellent. Thanks, Danielle. Um, so, yeah, we're going to talk about a lot of, of the education and training um, uh, preparation process in this uh, presentation. So um, throughout the, the history, outdoor and adventure therapy has become increasingly popular and is now practiced worldwide. Um, we have robust evidence through a multitude of outcome studies showing effectiveness um, of this approach. Um, however, there is very limited information in the research literature describing how practitioners are prepared to deliver outdoor and adventure therapy services. Most recently, though, there was one quantitative study that surveyed adventure therapists about their education and training. Um, the participants almost unanimously reported that they lacked formal training and got that instead from their own life experiences. Um, as someone that has gone through this process myself, um, that is actually consistent of what um, my process had looked like um, in my experiences. Um, some challenges that um, that was reported to access the formal trainings in this survey included a lack of local programs or financial difficulties. Um, therefore, many of them primarily rely on mentorship from more or experienced practitioners, um, as well as seeking specialized training at conferences or even learning on the job. Um, Though even with the available trainings that are difficult to access, um, a lot of the participants mm -hmm. reported a lack of discussions around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And with our um, global trend that want that is continuously uh, more aware and conscientious of this uh, need, um, we really wanted to address that um, from our from our study. Um, can you go to the next space, please? Thank you. Um, so despite the popular popularity of outdoor and adventure therapy, our field has faced our field has faced criticism for its insufficient integrate integration of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and here on um, we'll address as DEI um, in an acronym. There's almost no research describing DEI in um, the outdoor and adventure therapy education and training. 
Um, you could see in the outdoor therapies outdoor therapies um, book, there is a chapter um, that's written by Denise Mitten really addressing this issue. Um, and so although we do see this lack of uh, support from the outdoor and adventure therapy uh, world, um, there are multiple guidelines that we can lean on for DEI in more traditional clinician training and practices. Yay! Um, there are several ethical codes across the helping professions, um, addresses multiculturalism, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and social justice, um, with some even have like dedicated task forces and committees continuously developing and revising specific guidelines to enhance culturally competent practice um, beyond the professional ethical standards. So for instance, um, the psychologist world, they have the APA, um, they have the multicultural guidelines endorsed by APA. Um, and then within the um, counseling world, there is the multicultural and social justice counseling competencies um, that is um, developed through the ACA, their Association of Counseling, um, uh, American Association of Counseling, um, that um, really provides guidelines for integrating multicultural and social justice competencies into clinical practices, education, and research even. Um, then in the social work world, the, the NAS, NASW offers the culturally responsive guidance through the standards and indicators uh, for cultural competence in social work practice. Um, so you can see that all of these frameworks really emphasize um, intersectionality and promote professional self-awareness, not just in client care, but also in the educational environment. There's even, so beyond all these guidelines, there's tens and thousands, lots of articles, um, even some journals dedicated just for uh, multiculturalism, social justice, and DEI in general. Um, so then that leads us to the question, why are um, our field, the adventure and outdoor, the outdoor and adventure therapy uh, field, so far behind um, than the other um, more traditional therapies? Um, therefore, here we are. That's what we're hoping to address. We're really hoping to fill in the gaps. Um, so this presentation, um, we will, it's the, uh, the, uh, the majority of the content of this presentation is taken from a manuscript that the team, our team is currently working on in the final stages um, like to develop the um, manuscript. Um, and uh, we uh, conducted an international survey of adventure therapy practitioners to look at what is their process um, that prepared them towards becoming an adventure therapist now. Um, it is, this current presentation is taken from a larger start study exploring three areas um, on practitioners' uh, overall educational experiences, their beliefs about professionalism and effectiveness, um, and also their experiences related to DEI in their education and training. Um, the research question for current this study, uh, specific, specifically for this presentation, is how do adventure and outdoor therapy providers describe how diversity, equity, and inclusion were addressed in their education and training. And I just want to quickly say, I am so geeked about trying to make OAT the acronym that we use for outdoor and adventure therapy. I'm like, and Will was even like, oh, we should add meal on the end. And he came up with something for M-E-A-L. So we're going to see if we can make that stick and make the rest of the field hate us for, for making our field of practice OAT. I love the acronym. So uh, we're going to jump into the methods now, kind of what we did and why. So this is a mixed method study, uh, meaning that we're doing quantitative and qualitative together, and we're not just doing them separately. We're blending them together to compare kind of the outcomes that we have from both of them. This is a survey project. Uh, we did survey research internationally using Google Forms. You can see little survey up in the corner. And I know some of you are going to say, oh, that's familiar. I remember filling out that survey. I was a part of that. Um, 
And we, uh, we, we developed the survey and then we pilot tested it with some field experts to make sure that we were asking some of the right questions and that we were building a rigorous survey to learn about uh, adventure and outdoor therapy, education, professionalism, and practice. Um, and we also, this was informed by previous research. Some of the research that, that I've done, it says Impress actually been published now uh, in 2024. Um, I just didn't update that yet. And uh, so we're using this as a foundation. So we're building a rigorous survey based on prior research and based on experts in the field about what types of things we should ask to learn about this. So um, after that process, we ended up coming up with 50 quantitative questions, uh, mostly multiple choice and then seven open-ended qualitative questions. So we had 57 questions as a whole. Um, and uh, we we put this out there and um, got folks to, uh, and we'll talk more about who responded to it in a little while. Um, and then afterwards we're doing descriptive and correlational analysis uh, as well in the, in the quantitative and then thematic analysis on the qualitative and then mixed methods triangulation where we're comparing the results from both the quantitative and the qualitative to have a better understand of, understanding of what practitioners in the field think about this kind of stuff. So now we're gonna jump into talking a little bit about the sample. Okay, so um, as as Dan said, it was delivered online. Um, the the survey was delivered online to an international um, group of of people. Um, we had a N of eighty six, and they came from a variety of different different um, countries. But clearly, you can see from the numbers, a large number of folks came from the United States, with a a smaller but still representative, well, not representative, but a smaller group from Australia, and then a diverse group of, of other countries had a few folks um, as respondents. Um, this is a proposal sample from, from uh, groups with expertise in adventure therapy, and specifically some groups that were included were the Therapeutic Adventure Professionals Group, the Australian Association of Bush Professionals, and the International Adventure Therapy Group. And um, because there was no known sampling frame, this was a way to kind of control for not have to reduce the likelihood of bots um, and, and still include people who had this expertise. And the inclusion criteria included um, having the expertise of being a provider of adventure and outdoor therapy services um, and being over the age of 21. Christy, can I ask a quick question? Because someone asked me this earlier. What is sure. a sampling frame? Sure. A sampling frame is when you have a known entity, right? That you're starting from a known number of folks. An example of this would be if we had chosen to just um, pull, like only survey the um, the entirety of people who belong to the International Adventure Therapy Group, right? So, and then, and then we've been able to say there are this many people in that group and we then got responses from this many folks, right? So we know what we're starting with. Um, this is also something you can use if you're Surveying like licensed professionals because there's a list of that, right? But um, because so many different people from so many diverse sort of practices utilize these um these skills in their in their practice, it it would be almost impossible to come up with a sampling frame. Yeah, that there's no, no way of knowing how many people are doing outdoor and adventure therapy across the world. So it's kind of that unfortunately makes it so we can't do that representative sample. Thank you so much. Absolutely. I, I like that you're keeping me on my toes with my research methods um, teaching. Um, so <laughs> no, no, I appreciate it. Um, so so uh, yeah, so talking about the sample and how it, how it breaks down a little bit, um, we had a, you know, somewhat even a representation as far as gender goes, um, a little bit um, higher, more females than males. And we had three folks who identified on the survey that they were non-binary. Um, we have a largely Caucasian and um, well-educated group, right? So if you look at these numbers, we have 79% um, uh, put identified as they were Caucasian on the survey. And then um, mm. a, you know, well over half of folks have master's degrees or above. Um, so uh, we also had a, a a uh, 43 year old mean um, in age and the respondents ranged from 26 to 85 years old. Um, yeah, and I'm ready for the next slide whenever, whenever you are. Perfect. Okay, so so this is really interesting because we have some some pretty large sort of like majorities, but at the same time, a really interesting and diverse set of folks in these different groups. So um, so when we think about sort of your primary profession, you can see that 
about half, a little bit more than half of the of the sample were either in social worker counseling, but also included a large number of of other sorts of fields um, or professions. Um, Additionally, when we think of the kind of treatment settings, there are a couple that sort of stand out as having more folks in them, right? So private practice, community mental health, um, not-for-profits, or working in wilderness slash remote slash bush. We kind of did a little bit of, of um, collapsing of a category there. Um, and so those are the groups that really stand out as being the ones that are more highly represented. But as you can see, we have a number of other other um, treatment settings that that are in the sample. Um, similarly, can I say something about that real quick, Christy? Absolutely. I think it's so cool when you look at the diversity of the practice settings, because there's this kind of public perception that, that we're all wilderness-based therapy people. And I mean, this is folks across the board and actually primarily working in private practice, nonprofit or community mental health. And I thought that was super cool about this sample. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. That's awesome. Um, additionally, when you look at um, who, what the age of clients, right? So youth workers really stand out here with almost 50% of the sample. Um, but but truly, 20% uh, of the sample works with multiple age groups. So so we thought that was, that was interesting. Um, and then finally, we have a large number of folks when it's a job title and role that identify as therapists, right? So about half the sample. Um, and then there are really some interesting, you know, we have we have seven folks who their primary role is, is field guide, mental health tech, paraprofessional. And then we have a lot of folks in kind of macro practice or administrative work. Um, so so that is that's a little a little um, sort of set of nuggets around the kind of folks who answered this um, when you think about the next the the next slides when we talk about the results. Are you ready for that? Yeah. Wonderful. So these are the the items that we identified as being related to DEI and then and sort of the breakdown of specifically people's answers. Um, we used a Likert scale ranging from one to five with one being strongly disagree and and five being strongly agree. And as you can see from this, um, people had, had some opinions, right? So when it comes to thinking about the kind of diversity they found regarding racial and ethnic diversity in their programs and classrooms, folks generally were more likely to disagree, right? So, so um, when you look at this sample, uh, more than, well, more than half uh, either disagreed or strongly disagreed that their classrooms had sufficient diversity. Um, when it comes to when they found if their education or training was inclusive of folks with different levels of ability, um, people were, and I, I, we have a nice pie chart here, but I'm going to look at the, at the, numbers as well. So when it came to physical ability, people were a little bit more more neutral with about 30% disagreeing with that statement, about 30% kind of saying uh, they didn't really have, they were neutral on that, and then about 25% agreed um, that it was inclusive. Um, as far as gender diversity, we are looking at, again, a more neutral response. So about a little bit over 20% disagreed with that, but about 30% agreed with um, 35 just not really having an opinion, being pretty neutral. Um, and then finally, uh, a place where people were more inclined to agree was related to inclusivity of, from the LGBTQ community in relation to their education and training. And, and about 70, 78% um, were either neutral or agreed with that. So so yeah, when it comes to individual individual item level at the Likert scale, these are kind of our results. And then I'll talk a little bit about the ways in which we we tried to gain a little bit more meaning from that. Wonderful. So for this part, you are looking at um, these items being treated as a more continuous variable and showing the mean levels of agreement. And and as you can see, they're they're organized from from least agreement to most agreement, right? So um so you can see that that as far as like the, the mean score of folks um, identifying uh, racial and ethnic diversity as being being suitable is uh, is is relatively low, two point one seven. Whereas when we go up to the the gender diversity and LGBTQ community um, inclusivity, they are closer to a neutral or agree or or neither agree nor disagree. And I'm ready for the next slide. Whenever you are. Ah, okay. And then so finally, we did some, um, as we used independent sample t-tests to assess for relationships between the difference between um, uh, whether or not folks agreed or disagreed with a series of statements. And, and um, this is, this is not my most updated slide, but that is okay. This is, these are very true statements that I will talk you through. So, um, so basically, on, on, um, as far as the adventure and outdoor 
therapy training programs being having a sufficient level of racial and ethnic diversity, um, white respondents were more likely to agree with that statement. I'm sorry, they were less likely to agree with that statement than non-white respondents. Um, and and interestingly, um, when it comes to to gender, uh, female and non-binary respondents were more likely to disagree with this statement than than male respondents. So so both white respondents and female and non-binary respondents were more likely to identify some deficits related to diversity um, regarding race. And then when it comes to gender diversity, uh, female and non-binary respondents were were less likely to agree that um that there were sufficient levels of gender diversity, which which tracks. Yeah. Now we're gonna jump into uh my part, the the qualitative part. And we had uh eight eight primary themes. Ah 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 for anyone that remembers the count from Sesame Street, I had to throw that in there because I am a gigantic dork. Um, so yeah, we did a thematic analysis. So we went through and we looked at all of the open-ended questions and then we coded them and we found the themes that were jumping out. So we could jump into what that process looks like a little bit more, but we don't have enough time in this to be able to do that and then also answer questions. So instead, we're just going to share about what some of the themes are. But if anyone has questions on what that thematic analysis looked like, please reach out, connect. I would love to geek out about qualitative analysis with you. But these were the themes that we were able to distill from what folks told us. And the first one of those was the presence of dominant identities and narratives and then underrepresentation. A common theme in almost half of the responses was a discussion of how they observed dominant identities, um, powered identities and underrepresentation of other identities. So many respondents noted that DEI is often either unrepresented or completely absent in the field. Um, and that 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 was a, a big problem that was reported. Um, next, they talked about the current status of various identities in the field. Participants reported some identities are far more included than others, and that there were places where maybe doing a little bit better, maybe a little bit worse. They emphasized that while gender and sexual orientation were somewhat considered, um, they didn't say it was like, okay, this is good, this is taken care of, they're somewhat considered. Issues of race and ability were not adequately addressed at all. So they also focused on financial barriers faced by individuals from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. So they really kind of got intersectional on the, the different identities that they were talking about there. Um, next, and I think this was one of the most fascinating themes, folks talked about incongruences and discrepancies observed by participants regarding how diversity, equity, and inclusion are addressed across different contexts within outdoor adventure therapy education. And they said, okay, yeah, yeah, we have this in some places, we don't have this in others. This is not present in our education the way that it should have been. But yeah, you go to professional development trainings, you go to IATC or ABAT or TAPG, you're going to get more of this than maybe we had in our uh, college-based training. Um, they also said similarly, this was not covered in education, but yeah, we had this in work after we graduated and we got more training on how to do this stuff. Um, they, they included the DEI stuff there. Um, also another discrepancy and incongruence is this is not present in adventure and outdoor, but it's present in their social work, counseling, marriage and family therapy, et cetera, education. So it was kind of this idea that like, okay, we do that in the main part of the education. And then once we get to the outdoor and adventure therapy stuff, we forgot about it. We've passed it over. Um, and so that, that was kind of interesting there too. Um, and then yes, the last one, Yes, we talk about this stuff, we pay lip service to it, but not in our execution or not in the representation. There was kind of some talk about how we have a lot of groups of people that are not very diverse talking about the importance of diversity, equity, inclusion, but then when the rubber hits the road, it's really kind of missing there. The next three themes, uh, improvement, evaluation, of DEI, and formal education, and representation. So this improvement one, Worth celebrating. A number of respondents recognize that this has made a big difference. There were folks who talked about how they've been in this field for a long time and that we are getting better in this area. Diversity, equity, inclusion in outdoor and adventure therapy field across time has started to really improve. They've talked about progress over time, attitudes and recognition, and strategies for DEI application. And seeing uh, those were the three sub themes and that we've seen improvement across all of those areas. Um, 
Next, they, they shared about evaluation of DEI in formal education. Uh, over half of the respondents indicated that either there was a clear lack or of limited integration of DEI in formal education, identifying it as a growth area for the field. Um, and then we put this into five different sub-themes about where it's lacking, lacking in undergraduate, lacking in adventure outdoor courses, addressed in social worker counseling, so a little bit of overlap with what we had before, there were certain concepts that were covered and then certain concepts that were missed or weren't covered. And then they talked about barriers of being able to apply this in, in the education for DEI. Um, next was representation. This also kind of crosses over with that incongruence a bit. They talked about in regards to staff, colleagues, faculty, peers, cohorts, leaders, client, everyone involved with outdoor and adventure therapy education um, and that Participants describe their courses as including people from all walks in life, uh, but also as not including. So there's kind of a little bit of a, a mixture there. Um, this was a little bit of a less common theme than some of the other categories. Um, I think I kind of crossed over when I was discussing. I think I bled into talking about some of the underrepresentation and mixing that. So this was just about the representation who was represented in the field. Uh, and the last two were learning about DEI on the job, which we, we found was very important that so many folks described that their DEI training and preparation were provided once they began working in the field. And this came from some older as well as some younger uh, participants who said, hey, maybe this stuff wasn't in college when they started or they recently graduated and it still wasn't there in the way they expected, but then they got it in their internship or their field placement. Uh, and they got it through working with diverse colleagues and uh, clients and also the, the additional conferences and training. So really continuing to do that, the, those continuing education as they moved on. Um, and last was we, we had um, kind of our negative case examples, which were the microaggressions. For the most part, we had folks talking about DEI stuff as important and what were the gaps and what was missing towards getting there. But then we did have some folks who talked about it on the other end. And these were uh, where folks kind of negated the rationale and the concepts being explored in regards to DEI work and outdoor adventure therapy education. These were a small percentage of the responses, but we did get some. So we coded them at the negative case examples as microaggressions. And these were clearly refuting the need. We don't need to do this. I don't know why we're focusing on this stuff again. Um, I don't know why we keep talking about gender. I think we had a kind of can't people just be people sort of comment. So um, like I said, these were limited, but it is important to talk about those negative case examples and show that we're not just going in one direction or, or the other. So next we're going to jump into discussion and implications. Thanks, Dan. So yeah, what do we kind of pull away from all of this uh, information that we got from respondents? Uh, first and foremost, the thing that we notice and recognize is that within our pool of respondents that it lacked a pretty diverse uh, range of folks in and of itself. Um, as Christy kind of shared, it was um, very heavily uh, white identifying folks, um, cisgendered folks. Um, so recognizing that the perceptions of all these questions that we asked, um, we didn't necessarily get the most um, diverse pool of folks. Um, additionally, that many of the respondents were based in the US. Um, so we lack a lot of uh, kind of the international perspective that might also come from these questions that we asked. Um, However, we still pulled a lot of information that we think is really important um, and in the context that would be helpful for any training and education program. Um, first and foremost, recognizing the need to formalize um, DEI practices um, and uh, DEI-based concepts within outdoor adventure training programs and education. Um, so by having a more structured program uh, and recognizing that uh, sure, a lot of folks are getting things in the field, but the need for it to be a foundational basis as students um, or professionals are starting to build through either certificate programs um, or classes that they're taking uh, in their college programs. Um, another piece is recognizing the need to diversify the student population and faculty within these programs themselves. Um, so 
identifying that um, there are some barriers, presumably, that are, are keeping folks from maybe being interested in taking classes um, or being involved in programs, um, recognizing the way in which faculty themselves, um, who is teaching these classes, um, and thinking about, you know, what are the, what are the strategy, strategies that we could identify in order to increase diversity within the student and faculty populations, um, looking at and examining how are students being recruited, how's faculty being recruited, um, who's learning about these types of opportunities, um, which kind of brings into another aspect is the need to increase accessibility um, for conferences. Um, and so thinking about where these conference locations are, um, folks talked about potentially the way in which the location creates barriers to entry and accessibility, and looking at what types of content is being presented at conferences. Um, so looking at what are the topics, who are the speakers, um, and examining ways in which to diversify um, conference attendance itself. Um, additionally, recognizing the need to address some of the incongruencies. So as Dan pointed out, that was one of the major themes that kind of showed up um and oops i just lost my screen there we go uh and so thinking about the ways in which to collaborate with departments and so whether there's an outdoor adventure therapy program based within a school of social work a counseling program um, wherever it's being housed at the university nearly all of these programs have their own approaches at increasing DEI principles within the school themselves. And so thinking about how can faculty be collaborating with um, other faculty and I'd say students themselves um, to figure out how can these DEI principles become more an integrative part um, to OAT programming. <clears throat> um, additionally, thinking about the way in which to um, I think this part and the next bullet kind of go hand in hand, but how can this become more real world application? Um, and so one of the primary principles of outdoor adventure therapy programming is experiential learning. Um, and so how can we take this from theoretical discussions <clears throat> and actually emphasizing DE principles in practice? Um, and so first and foremost, I'd say thinking about what can that look like in the classroom? Um, I know in the like adventure therapy world, we talk about the seven adventure therapy beliefs. And um, that's something that I know when I'm teaching classes, I talk with all of my students about how are these principles actually showing up in the classroom themselves. Um, and so when we think about um, bringing D DEI concepts into oh, programming um, and moving it beyond the classroom, thinking about how can students be bringing this specifically into field placements, um, into uh, wherever they might be doing some of this work. Um, additionally, are there ways to partner with community-based agencies um, to be implementing and, and identifying ways in which um, these DEI principles can be brought into programming? Um, and then lastly, working to develop field placements um, at locations with on-the-job training. Um, so <clears throat> again, thinking about the way in which um, practitioners, uh, if they're even placed somewhere like making sure supervisors have access to content that they themselves are informed um, to make sure that uh, <clears throat> these principles are uh, being implemented. Great question, Graham. What are the seven adventure therapy beliefs? Uh, so whenever I'm put on the spot, I always forget one or two of them, but uh, seven adventure therapy. Chris, can I quickly say before you do this, that there was a put on the spot with all of the leadership council with TAPG and everyone just argued back and forth. They couldn't remember them all. So you're totally good. <laughs> um, yeah. So there are things like um, effective communication, safety, trust, a sense of challenge, belonging, autonomy, um, and fun. I don't know if I said that one already. Um, so thinking about how these kind of different concepts can be brought into all the work that we do. Um, for anyone who's wanting to dive a little bit deeper into that, um, Daniel did just put, <clears throat> so if you read um, anything related to the facilitated wave model, um, the seven adventure therapy beliefs kind of show up um, within that space. Oh, probably ready for the next slide, huh?
Um, Dan, do you want to hit that first point? Oh, yep, yep, yep. Um, so one of the first uh, big implications with future research is we need additional research on outdoor adventure therapy education across the world. Uh, we, we don't have enough research on outdoor and adventure therapy education at all, but we really need to start expanding that and see what it looks like in diverse perspectives. And even in places that maybe they're not using that terminology because there are a lot of different places where people are using adventure, outdoor and nature-based therapeutic approaches that aren't necessarily within the realm of the community of adventure therapists or outdoor therapists that, that, that a lot of us know. So we need to do a better job of reaching out to some of those folks. And that includes surveys that are not just translated into other languages, but are also developed in other languages and are culturally informed uh, by folks from those different communities. We shared the survey when we did it um, with uh, the Taiwanese Therapeutic Adventure Professional Group and the Asian Association of Experiential Education. And I think we got very, very few respondents from that. And that was an oversight on our part because we probably didn't do a good job of making it available in languages that would be accessible and approachable. So we need new re or more research to tap into those that we weren't able to access here. Um, and so that that's a really important focus for future research in this realm. Um, and so, yeah, and that kind of next point was a little bit what I was covering there too, is that there are folks that fit within our definition, um, but maybe don't identify as this. I think of a lot of the Shinrin Yoku folks in Japan who are doing incredible work on forest bathing. And if we talked about what we consider outdoor adventure therapy, um, they'd say, yeah, yeah, uh, that, that definitely fits. Um, if you ask those folks, they're, they're doing something different, but we also need to tap in and learn about what's happening in those different spaces because that's a piece of bridging the, the diversity gaps that, that exist. Um, next, we really need to start developing some sampling frames of people who are doing outdoor and adventure therapy. And um, there's some different ways that we could do this, and it might be figuring out lists of all of the folks within those different professional associations and surveying all of them. That wasn't previously available to us when we launched a survey because some of them don't actually have a full list, um, other ones do. For example, we did send this out to the entire list and the International Adventure Therapy Group, um, but we don't have an entire list for say TAPG or ABAT. Um, so there, there were some missing components there. Um, someone's probably gonna correct me on something and say, no, there is a, a list, maybe there is, but um, we can work on developing a bigger or better sampling frame. And part of that may even be looking at all people from a group of therapy uh, educators or therapy practitioners. So something like the Council on Social Work Education or the American Counseling Association Education Group and sampling the entire group with some filtering questions that narrow down just to people doing outdoor and adventure therapy. So there's some different tips and tricks that can be done to get there. Um, but, but yeah, we need to to work there. Um, did you want to jump on the next one, Chris? Sure. Yeah. So something else we talked about that um, we think would be really important research to do is identifying what's actually going on that's going really well. Um, so what are the effective approaches already being used in different types of outdoor adventure therapy curriculum? Um, so we know, uh, I just last year actually launched um, the first outdoor social work class at the University of Washington. And then like trying to build that class out, you know, I was just emailing a bunch of folks I knew within the field who, um, hey, can I look at your syllabus to kind of get an idea of how to build this? And so, you know, there's a lot of these things that are happening in, in silos, but um, actually like coming together and we talked about that importance of maybe needing a more formalized um kind of DEI curriculum. Um, and, and not that it needs to be so rigid, but thinking about, you know, is there a best practices or what are some resources and ways in which if someone were to want to launch a program or for programs that are already existing um, to kind of cross-reference and look at um, what's, um, yeah, what's going well and, and how can that be implemented? Um, additionally, thinking about the perceived barriers to outdoor adventure therapy programs as related to DEI. Um, so examining what's stopping students, faculty, and practitioners from taking a course, um, what's stopping them from um, potentially pursuing a certificate program or utilizing these in their practices, um, what are the barriers that they're seeing at their agencies, um, so kind of identifying 
yeah, where's this perception of barriers for this work? Um, something we talked about is there's a lot of research out there that looks at um, barriers for um, folks in with minority identities to therapy in general and folks with within marginalized communities into the outdoors. But where's that kind of overlap of when therapy practices are happening in outdoor adventure field? Um, yeah, what are what are these barriers that are showing up for folks? So last is we want to hear your ideas. We want to hear your thoughts. We know that we have folks in this room who are outdoor and adventure therapy practitioners, students, and educators. And we'd love to hear what, what came up for you as we were talking about this work, things that you maybe agreed with, things that you disagreed with. And we also want to hear about what your experiences were like in this regard. And maybe you, you didn't have the opportunity to take our survey, but if you can share with us now, this will help to inform our process as we're, we're writing this up to publish it and share it. Uh, we want to know how did DEI show up in your interactions within outdoor and adventure therapy practice, education, or kind of all of the above. So we've got, um, I think about 15 minutes or so, so we can answer some questions and talk a little bit more about uh, any aspect of this. You can put a question in the chat or you can also just unmute, totally okay. Maybe this is or is not related to this, Dan, but I know um looks like Stacy was asking some questions around pilot programming. And I was reading Stacy and Will's conversation back and forth. And I'm curious a little bit more, Stacy, if you would want to expand a bit more on your question. Not to Hi. throw on the spot, but I just did. <laughs> you definitely did. <laughs> it's okay. Welcome. <laughs> I was thinking like, or asking really, like if uh, like a trial version of like a, a service designed to test it basically um, and like test its impact before implementing it like on like a bigger scale. So I was just thinking of like in the context of all this amazing research, like you guys like really went all in and I love it. I learned so much. So thank you. Um, uh, my name is Stacey Delano. I am a UNF graduate student getting my master's degree in social work. <laughs> and uh, this is really interesting to me because I really, one of my um, things that I'm thinking of focusing on is like environmental social work. So that's like one of my little dreams that I'm thinking about. Um, but so I was thinking like, um, like how a student could develop like in universities, like we could make it more widely known where even for like, um, like a capstone project or something like that, like a student could develop a limited pilot program, like what I wrote um, for like youth at community centers or like even like partnering up with local organizations, like, hey, like I'm doing a capstone project XYZ and like stuff like that. And I know UNF, like they provided us um, with a lot of different places we can do our internships. And I would think that like, oh, maybe like some of those places would be interested in doing like a little pilot program thing where we could gather feedback and assess the outcomes and stuff, so. There you go. <laughs> we super appreciate that suggestion. And Stacy, yeah. since Stacy is one of my students, I'll I'll chime in a little bit and say that yes. I um another thank you so much for talking. I really appreciate it. And I'm so happy that you're here. Um yes. I, I think that one of the really interesting pieces that you're talking about as far as incorporating it into field placements for social work students is that we I imagine, you know, in the same way that we're talking about um, all of the different ways that folks are not necessarily aware of the overarching OAT community, um, I imagine that there are elements of this that are going on at most of our field placements, right? And um, I hope, right? That right, some yeah, component, that's what I was thinking, yeah. But that no one is really capturing those pieces. So to think about ways that um, people are intentionally doing this work, but maybe not maybe not fully a part of this community, um, I think would really maybe give us a diff some different insights into the diversity that these, maybe not the education piece, but who these programs are reaching. Um, I, I think that 
the, you make good points. And I think that um, encouraging more of this work amongst our students is, is a good idea. Yeah, like just put it on the students. I would. I mean, like if I were like, okay, like we need research for this. Like let's like throw it in like the syllabus really quick. Like I don't know. <laughs> I feel like there's ways. And UF, they're like really, they love like their research and stuff. And I feel like if they got in it, like it'd be pretty cool. But yeah, thank you <laughs> for answering. We have a great question down there from Fred. Uh, so Fred asks, what do you all believe we can start to do immediately, like in our next session about promoting DEI with individual clients or groups we work with? And I, I'm betting there's a couple different answers to this amongst our presenters, but I'm gonna jump in first because um, I was monitoring the chat. But uh, one thing is just removing that kind of internal silo that it seems like we saw in those incongruencies that were reported. A lot of people have been trained. They know how to do DEI stuff. They've been trained and they know how to do outdoor and adventure therapy stuff. But for some reason, we've been separating them. Like we've got our outdoor and adventure therapy hat on or we've got our DEI hat on and giving ourselves permission to start saying, hey, we know how to do DEI work. We know how to bring this into so many other places of our therapy and starting to look at what in our outdoor adventure therapy stuff might be missing some of this. Um, are we using activities that maybe are not as culturally accessible to some of our clients? Are there ways that we can adapt our activities to fit in with the culture, the outdoor experiential activities, and the games of the folks that we're working with? Um, I think that's a big piece. Um, uh, one of my mentors, a mentor of a lot of folks in, in the field and probably in this room as well, Tony Alvarez, he talked to me about how he was working with students uh, at one of the schools in Michigan where some of the games he was bringing up, they were just looking at him and going, this doesn't make sense. We don't do that stuff. This is not what we do in our community. And he stepped back and said, hmm, how can I adapt this? And he made cooperative uh, experiential challenges based on using basketball. The kids he was working with were all playing basketball and said, yeah, why am I doing this with a hike in the woods when that's making these kids uncomfortable and that that's not fitting within their cultural experience or what's available to them? And he adapted and took some of the same principles from that activity he was facilitating and applied it to, to games and activities that these kids he was working with were more familiar with. So that's the type of thing is I would, A, invite you to remove those silos um, and start focusing on how we can integrate them, but also look at maybe how can we adapt the different activities that we do to fit with what would be more culturally appropriate or culturally expected with, with the folks that we're working with. Did others have thoughts about that uh, instead of me just blabbing as I always seem to do? I have some th thoughts about it. I think one way to have like really immediate uh, effect is by acknowledging that this occurs, these incongruence occurs. Um, because I think, especially in one of the incongruencies, um, that there's a lot of talk, there's a lot of lip services, like what Dan was saying, um, the execution, what is the gap in between is often because it is very difficult to have these conversations. It takes uh, our own vulnerability as clinicians to stay, like to acknowledge that this is a, an area that we're not doing great. Um, and so I do think uh, being able to acknowledge that and say, hey, um, this is something that I'd like to work on and really have a real conversation with clients about it. And that comes in, comes with like broaching and really uh, like inviting the, the, the people, the clients that we're talking about to the table, because a lot of times they probably like know, um, like what Stacy was sharing, like put it on the students. Um, not in no way are we putting this on the clients, but instead of advocating for, um, I often think about advocating with these clients so that we bring them to empower their voices into how can we make this um, more, more really addressing their needs. Um, and uh, making it more inclusive for them. So I think it takes a lot of our own as clinicians uh, um, stance 
to, to be honest about this is an area of growth for our field. And I love the the suggestion Graham put in the, the box about having a menu of activities and letting the folks who are working with kind of choose or suggest alternate activities and how that can maybe stretch our brain a little bit. And then Will was chiming in that we have uh, in the Australian context uh, that they have developed some um, cool ways to do the required internships, new things. So there's some growing pains, but Will, could you speak to that? Do you have a... Audio. Yeah, it, as long as you can hear me, so tell me to shut up if my if my Wi-Fi gets weird. One of the things I, in Australian social work degree, you have to do two 500-hour placements, um, internships. We all know what those are like in the social work arena. And so what we got above the line, I actually worked with a student quite closely and got feedback from others, but we convinced the, the university and through our accreditation standards with the AASW that I'll just take responsibility of the whole 500 hours for one of the placements, but we'll get the students to go. We're losing your audio, Will. Sounds like Will's ship just got sunk by a collision with a whale. He looks very serious in the pose that he frozen. <laughs> so since Will got frozen, uh, we're wondering, are there other questions or comments or ideas that the folks had that they wanted to, to share or have the opportunity to ask? I was just gonna chime in a little bit. Um, and actually Stacy kind of hit a little bit of just like a good way might be to just ask your clients. And, you know, I, I think about, Will, who's like been such a mentor of mine around feedback informed treatment. And it's like, yeah, if you're already doing this work, how often are you checking in with clients to kind of find out, you know, are there assumptions you've been making or asking them ways in which, um, you know, their identity backgrounds can maybe be um, more integrated as part of programming, if that's something that they're looking for to find out if there's things that um, maybe have kind of missed the mark in some ways for them. You back, Will? Like a little I'll bit. Put the student blog in, and it will be it will be better than me cutting out again. Well, we've got just a few more moments. If anyone else has any additional questions, but if not, um, we're also happy you can reach out, and we'll uh, I can actually put my email in the chat. Um, can you share? contacts with the list of attendees will or well there's my email in the chat if anyone has any questions that come up and will will also share contact information so um yeah we're just extremely thankful that, that you all came to our talk and had some good questions for us and we hope that you got a lot out of it and if anything comes up please please reach out Going to.